And now from functional imaging with ultrasound, let's switch to functional imaging with diffuse optics with our next speaker, Joe Culver, who is Associate Professor of Radiology at Washington University in St. Louis. And he'll be talking about functional optical imaging of the brain. Do you know where the mover or the mouse is? So thank you, Sergio, for the opportunity to be part of this session. I'll be talking about mapping spontaneous brain activity. And so traditionally, functional neuroimaging has used tasks. So in this example from fMRI, the subject is asked to open or close their eye. And as they um, open their eyes, the signal goes up. As they close their eyes, the signal goes down. And if you add up a bunch of open images and subtract them from all of the closed images, then you can map um, the visual cortex. But you'll note on top of that activation signal, there's a bunch of variants that looks a little bit like noise. And over the last 10 years or so, the fMRI community has um, realized that there's some good stuff in that noise, and it's actually a, a large majority of it is actually spontaneous brain activity. And so you can map brain function using spontaneous activity if you analyze the resting state correlations and assign the correlation strengths to uh, functional connect connectivity strengths. So this method works very well in fMRI with FC, MRI, and humans. So you can map um, these higher level distributed networks like the executive control network or the dorsal attention network. And one of its great advantages over using tasks is it's at least 10 times faster. And because of that, it's allowed FC MRI to push farther into more neurological diseases than the um, previous task-based approaches. So what we're interested in doing is developing an, a mouse analog of FC MRI. And the, the reasons are, you know, sort of obvious. The, the um, mouse is a primary animal model for neuroscience, and it enables you to use of all of the power of genetic and molecular methods. And the trick is that FCMRI doesn't quite have the signal-to-noise ratio to, to be performed in mice. And so what we use is actually a very traditional optical setup using diffuse reflectance imaging. And we view the brain through the intact skull. And on the left is a movie of the oxyhemoglobin dynamics in just a spontaneous, with just spontaneous brain activity in a mouse. The movie sped up a little bit more than 10 times, but you can see that there's a fair amount of structure in this, um, in this image series. And you can analyze it um, by measuring the correlation between different positions. So for instance, if you measure the correlation between the blue spot and the green spot, they're highly correlated, whereas the red spot's not that correlated to the blue and green spots. And then you can make a map of the um, you can make a map from this method. So if, uh, on the upper right, let me get rid of these other ones for a second. Uh, it wants to go backward. It does not like. There we go. OK, so on the upper right-hand corner, there's a map, which is just the R values between the green seed and every other pixel in the mouse brain. And then we can move these seeds around the mouse, uh, the, about, around the field of view that we have, and we can map out all of these different functional regions. And from that, you can uh, start deducing the functional architecture and also the connections between these functional regions. And with this method, we can begin to study uh, neurological diseases. So here are the functional connectivity patterns for young mice um, in, a, in an Alzheimer's study. And here are the maps for the mice at 11 months old. And you can see that the functional connectivity has declined. And in particular, or more specifically, the functional connectivity has de declined in a region-specific way. And if we correlate the FC decline versus the amyloid beta uh, or, the, or the disease load, there's a strong correlation there. And then we can go, uh, again, wants to go too fast. OK, so you can do another slightly less intuitive analysis where you just look at the correlation between the, the baseline functional connectivity values 
and where the disease load ends, ends up at 11 months, and that functional connectivity um, parameters are actually predictive of the disease at 11 months. So functional connectivity has a bidirectional relationship um, with this Alzheimer's model. More recently, we've been studying stroke, and here are bilateral connectivity patterns from in the somatosensory regions for both humans and in mice. And if you look at uh, humans or mice that have subcortical strokes, so this is not damaged tissue in the cortex, it actually disrupts the cortical connectivity. So you can see from this example and also from the Alzheimer's study that these functional connectivity measures can be uh, quite a rich and interesting way to study neurological disease. In terms of going forward, I think the FCOIS has a fairly wide open future. Um, the current version, uh, even in its current state, it's actually usable for studying many diseases and therapies. And there are several technology developments that could be imagined. For instance, looking at alternate reporters of neural activity. And we're interested in extending this method to the field of view of the whole mouse brain using tomography. And that brings me to the second part, which is diffuse optical tomography in humans. So here, FCMRI works quite well. Um, and what we're interested in is taking FCDOT and imaging humans where FCMRI cannot go, for instance, in the operating room or intensive care environments. So if in, in this scenario, for FCDOT to be a bedside surrogate to FCMRI, we need to be able to image distributed high-level brain networks. And so for the past year, we've been working on developing an extended field of view high-density DOT system with 92 sources and 96 detectors and over 1,000 measurements. And it now covers about 50% of the accessible cortex. And within that field of view, we can image the visual, somatosensory, motor, and auditory cortices, as well as the lateralized language and also several cognitive regions. So to begin sort of assessing the imaging capabilities of this instrument, we started off with a hierarchical language processing task study. So first, the subjects were uh, asked to he were hearing words, and this lit up the auditory cortex. When they read words, it lit up the visual cortex. When they were asked to imagine speaking, so they're not actually moving their lips, they're just thinking about it, it activated the motor cortex. And finally, when they were asked to read nouns, and then like dog, and then generate a verb like bark, this activated a high level of audit or language processing area, Broca's area. And so to validate these images, we took the same eight subjects and imaged them with fMRI, and you can see that we got pretty good agreement between the two imaging modalities. Now, of course, what we're really interested in is imaging resting state um, connectivity patterns. So we started off uh, imaging the visual network, the auditory network, and then we also imaged or uh, put seeds to pick out some higher level uh, networks, including the dorsal attention network and the default mode network. Otherwise, you can kind of think of it as the daydreaming network. So the important thing about these last two is that they are higher level networks, and also in, in addition to just having bilateral connectivity patterns, they also have anterior, posterior connectivity patterns. And again, in these eight subjects, we picked out, or we imaged them with FCMRI and got remarkably similar patterns between the two imaging modalities. So in parallel to these efforts with the large field of view system, we also moved into some pilot studies in the operating room and the neonatal intensive care unit. And you can see in these situations, we were using a somewhat more modest um, field of view system. And that brings me to my challenges slide, which is field of view, resolution, and wearability. You know, each of these individually have been addressed by numerous groups over the last 10 years. And I think going forward, the real question is, can we have all of it at once? And so I'll leave that as a discussion question for, you know, beers later tonight. The, the answer is yes, maybe three years. Um, and I'll just leave you with an acknowledgement slides, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>